Britain, World War II. As Nazi bombs rain down on London, a crime wave is taking place across the nation's capital. A million homes destroyed, hundreds of thousands of people turned into refugees, people living in shelters and subway stations. It creates the perfect environment for criminality. Emerging from the city's smoldering ashes is a race for unprecedented control of the underworld. Suddenly we had a character who was rising above a lot of the minor criminals in London. This was a guy who people were genuinely scared of. A new godfather is poised to seize power and his reign will change the streets of London forever. September 1939, Germany invades Poland. The world is at war. As Hitler's armies begin their relentless march across Europe, they bring with them a new and fearsome tactic of war, terror bombing of civilian populations. The prospect of the German Luftwaffe darkening English skies is a major concern for the British government. Churchill himself had warned Parliament as early as 1934 that in the event of war, the nation should expect an air assault on London that will drive millions of people into the open country outside the capital. The idea of terror bombing was that you would rain high explosive bombs or incendiaries on enemy population centers and absolutely freak the population out. And the Committee on Imperial Defense estimates 600,000 dead, 1.2 million wounded if the Luftwaffe blitzes London. When bombers came over a city, first of all, they couldn't be stopped. They were going to get through. And when they bombed, they were going to cause such cataclysmic damage that basically civilization would end. Akin to nuclear war today, the missiles will get here before we can react, and it will re result in untold devastation. And the British are absolutely you know, appalled by the prospect. If you hit London, where they keep the government, then people are going to panic. Morale would collapse, there would be a revolution, and the government would be forced to surrender. But Britain is prepared for the Nazi assault. On the 10th of July, 1940, the RAF takes to the skies to intercept the invading German Air Force. The Battle of Britain begins. The British Fighter Command is much more resilient than the Nazis anticipate. Its ability to recover downed pilots, its ability to maintain its production of aircraft despite German bombing, its ability to weather the attacks on its airfields and still stay in the fight. After two months of this, Hitler becoming desperate, wanting to have a victory over the British so that he can turn his attention to the Soviet Union, then decides to shift to a bombing campaign, the Blitz. By September 1940, Despite the early success in the Battle of Britain, the British government's worst fears are realized. Reichsmarshal Hermann Goering orders the Luftwaffe to bomb English cities. The Blitz begins. The idea of the Blitz is that he's going to take out key industries, key facilities, key ports, and he's going to spread terror. From the first attack on London, the 7th of September 1940, there were 57 consecutive night attacks on London, every single night. For the British people, the people underneath the bombs, this was suddenly something new. The Battle of Britain had taken place in the air above their heads in southern England. They'd seen it, but now suddenly they were being targeted. Some people would be sheltering in Anderson shelters, which were little personal shelters you had in your back garden, where just you and your family would be in it. Some people were sheltering in the London Underground. Interestingly, the government didn't really want people to shelter in the underground. They tried to keep people out of the underground at first. Sounds extraordinary now, but genuinely, they were worried that sort of underground troglodyte communities of antisocial people and antisocial behavior would develop. Fearing chaos on the streets of London, the British government executes its plan for the outbreak of war. Alongside the blackout, an order that all lights be extinguished after nightfall, it introduces a series of strict regulations designed to maintain social order in the face of unremitting bombing. 
a whole raft of defence regulations were brought in, covering things like the blackout, covering things like people's behaviour, where they could and could not go. Defeatism became illegal. People who moaned about the war ran the risk of being reported and even imprisoned. So it became very much a police state of all the ironies. We were fighting a police state, Nazi Germany, and yet to an extent we had to create one. Some people were absolutely terrified of what was going on. People who were affected personally, people who were bombed out themselves, or people who knew people who were hurt, obviously had a horrifying time. For others, and you know, this may seem a little surprising, the Blitz was a very liberating time. And the first to feel liberated by the Blitz are London's criminals. At the outbreak of war, a general amnesty empties the prisons, putting some of the city's toughest gangsters back on the streets. Among them is Billy Hill, 28 years old and already a notorious thief. While a nation gripped with fear prepares for German bombs, Hill sees an opportunity. Billy Hill came from a criminal family. There are such families in Britain as there are in any country. His father was a thief, his mother was a fence receiver of stolen goods. His sister, Maggie, was the best of them all. She was known as the queen of the baby elephants. It was a holy women shoplifting gang, cleared out store after store up and down the countryside. And he'd been brought up with the great criminals of the day, for example, Eddie Guerin, a high class in his time robber who escaped from Devil's Island and was said to have eaten his companions to survive. He was a friend of the family, uh, so was Alice Diamond, who was another of the 40 thieves. Born William Charles Hill on the 13th of December, 1911, Billy grows up as part of a large family of Irish immigrants in the Seven Dials area of London's West End. A criminal slum, really. It was a series of rabbit warrens with very poor living conditions. Now, Billy was one of 21 kids. They weren't all bent, but he was. He carried on his parental tradition. All around him was poverty. And of course, poverty bred crime. And in order to survive, you had to commit crimes, even if you were 10 years old. He was a grocery delivery boy from the age of nine, and he carried out various petty thefts from that age too. So he became a small-time crook. During his teens, Billy Hill was in and out of juvenile detention centres for a variety of minor crimes. In those juvenile detention centres, he met other kids who were professional criminals, who were already steeped in crime, and really that was his education. A natural leader, by the 1930s, Hill had established his own gang in the North London borough of Camden. The gang's criminal activities draw them into turf wars with other local outfits, and as they emerge victorious, Hill becomes feared as a cold and violent adversary. These guys were pretty adept at burglaries, robbing bank employees, but there was something extra chilling about Billy Hill and his gang, because Hill used to leave a V mark on the face of a lot of his victims. He would do this with what's known as a chiv, which is a very narrow, sharp knife. But he was careful not to murder anybody. He used to say, murder is a mug's game. And he always used to slash down with his razor rather than up. Up runs the risk of cutting an artery, down does not. He later called it good public relations. What he meant was he could scare his enemies as well as scaring his victims. As a daring thief, Hill pioneers a series of techniques that transform crime in London and bring an unstoppable wave of lawlessness to the capital. First among them is an explosive new type of motorized jewel heist, the smash and grab raid. Smash and grab robberies were becoming very prevalent at this time. They were literally as they sounded. You'd smash the window of a shop, dip your hand in and pull out as much jewelry and watches as you could lay your hands on before the police turned up. They were very dramatic. Hill often used open top cars so that getting in and out was even quicker. You simply jump in, you simply jump out. 
On other occasions, he used his gang members posing as detectives who would go into jeweler shops and warn those jewelers about the, the risk of smash and grab raids and they really must be alert and what kind of safety techniques did they have uh, and Hill was able to capitalize on that too. Hill and his gang committed so many smash and grabs that the newspapers called it a crime wave and the publicity from it became bigger and bigger on each and every smash and grab he committed. There were just day after day headlines, jewels stolen, furs stolen and so forth. And indeed the Home Secretary made a, a statement in the House of Commons that this was going to be stopped. Suddenly we had a character who was rising above a lot of the minor criminals in London. And this was a guy who people were genuinely scared of. And for Billy Hill, the outbreak of war in 1939 is the perfect setting in which to launch an all-out assault on London's underworld. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Nineteen forty. Hitler's bombs are raining down on London. As Germany's campaign of terror bombing, known as the Blitz, brings chaos to the lives of the ordinary British citizen, one man is seeking to capitalize on the moment. For career gangster Billy Hill, the war provides the perfect opportunity to seize control of the city's criminal underworld. London's underworld up until 1939, 1940, was far more arbitrary, far more disorganized. The kind of crime that was occurring in London's underworld would have been recognizable to a time traveler from a previous century. It was the usual crimes that preyed upon human weaknesses and human greed. Smash and grab, fencing, illegal gambling dens, a bit of prostitution, and a bit of drugs. In London, Criminal activity is dominated by a few powerful gangs that hail from the city's slums. The professional underworld was very much dominated by the old family gangs. Loose associations of criminals held together really by their family or ethnic backgrounds. So you've got Jewish gangs, Italian gangs, Irish gangs, all grouped by neighborhood. In London, the principal people running what we would call crime would be the Sabinis. They were an Italian family from Saffron Hill, which was in Clerkenwell. They were led by a man called Darby, who was one of the younger brothers, curiously, uh, and his youngest brother, a man who always went by the name of Harry Boy. The Sabinis were violent men. They had fought, just after the First World War, a long battle with people called the Brummagen Boys, and a man called Kimber, who wanted to control the racetracks. Racetrack crime was basically protection rackets. So a gang would go to a bookie and demand money from that bookie. Otherwise, he'd be beaten up, possibly even killed. They would demand money for the very seat that the bookie sat on. They would demand money for the chalk he used to mark up his tic-tac signs. They would demand money even for the sponge that was used to wash the chalk off. The Sabinis were a protection gang, really, and they moved into protecting clubs in Soho, bars in Soho, that sort of thing. It's often been said that if London is the capital of crime, Soho is the capital of London crime. Soho had evolved as this epicentre of crime because of its central location in London, because of its small buildings, its alleyways. It was the perfect location for crime to thrive. It had always had a pretty unsavoury, racy reputation for two or three centuries. Illicit gambling dens, prostitution of all sorts, male, female, and specialised, and spielers, drinking dens or gambling dens. They were illegal because they weren't licensed or they flaunted and flouted all the licensing regulations they could. Once you were in control of Soho, you certainly had a lot of power. 
And during the years between the two world wars, a fierce battle rages in the underworld as various neighborhood gangs vie with the Sabinis for control of both the racetracks and the lucrative rackets of Soho. The Cortese brothers, Enrico and Augustus, were at one time part of the Sabinis, but they fell out, they wanted a bigger share of the take. And there was a fight in the Fratellanza Club, which was down in Clerkenwell, in which Harry Boy Sabini was shot and Darby Sabini had the ignominy of having his false teeth broken. Some people called the Whites also now wanted a share of the profits. And throughout the 1920s, the late 1920s, there were a series of, of battles in and around Soho, culminating in 1927 with one called the Battle of Ham Yard. An agreement was made the Whites would have control of King's Cross, the Sabinis would control Clerkenwell still, and people called the Elephant Boys, who came from the Elephant and Castle, would have a look in, at any rate, at the very least, a look in on Soho. But when Britain mobilizes for war, everything changes for Soho and London's gangs. The introduction of national defense regulations and fear for social stability sees the police launch a crackdown on organized crime. Racetracks are closed, rackets broken up, and the old criminal empires begin to collapse. Before the war, the attitude to, to the underworld from the police was kind of to look the other way a lot of the time. Once the war started, interestingly, even though the police were so busy elsewhere, even though the police lost a lot of its manpower to the army, the police actually started to clamp down on organized crime in Soho. And that clampdown coincided with the Sabini family basically being neutered. In June 1940, events in the war throw London's organized crime syndicates into total disarray. Italy entered the war in that month. A very large number of Britain's Italian population were interned. And these people suddenly became enemy aliens. And the effect this had on, for example, the Sabini family was that they were taken out of circulation. Suddenly, they lost their business. So there was a kind of power struggle in Soho to take the place, the, the, the vacuum that the Sabinis had left. This worked out very well for Billy Hill and his cohorts, because suddenly, the crime that the Italians had been specializing in was free for them. With the Sabinis neutralized, the chaos of the war has put Billy Hill in a position to launch a violent takeover of the Soho clubs. And as law and order starts to break down under the terror of Hitler's bombs, his campaign of robbery, heists and racketeering is poised to change the nature of crime forever. September the 7th, 1940. The Blitz commences. London is pounded for 57 consecutive nights as Hitler aims to batter Britain into submission. Nearly a 1,000 German aircraft fill the skies. By mid-November, they have dropped 12,000 tons of high explosives and one million incendiary bombs. On December the 29th, the Luftwaffe drops over 24,000 high explosive and 100,000 incendiary bombs in a single night, creating firestorms that burn at 1,000 degrees Celsius. No lights are permitted after sunset, and beneath the crack of anti-aircraft fire and rumble of falling bombs, crime surges on the city's blacked-out streets. Violence and robbery is widespread. A mysterious killer is prowling the famous West End and public order threatens to collapse under the campaign of Nazi terror. You've got a million homes destroyed in London. You've got hundreds of thousands of people turned into refugees. You've got people living in shelters and subway stations and that sort of thing. It creates the perfect environment for criminality. This was the opportunity, a golden opportunity to make money. Not only do we have a blackout in which People could be robbed in the street, they could be coshed. Prostitutes could ply their trade relatively safely, but you've got the idea that you can steal. Theft increased. 
And theft increased enormously. Theft is always the most common crime in any country at any time. And the war made it possible because of the situation. One of the largest increases in crime at this time was from looting. And looting was very much an opportunistic crime. One minute, the house was there, the next minute it wasn't, and people who would never normally commit crimes would be tempted to, to take something by the side of the road or out of a, a shop window. Even the emergency services, for example, the auxiliary fire service or, or the heavy rescue, people who are meant to be helping, these people were taking advantage of the situation to get things for themselves. You know, they'd keep a watch out for police and then would just take things for themselves. And this was just happening all the time. There was also a darker side to crime in the blackout, and that's that bombed out buildings were a great place to dispose of bodies. We even have some examples, grim as it sounds, of people helping themselves to valuables like jewellery and watches on corpses. The effect of these conditions on public morale is profound. The blackout and the upsurge in crime that it brings proves to be one of Hitler's greatest weapons in his quest to break British resolve. Imagine for six years having to live behind blackout curtains with very limited light, but essentially drives humanity underground in a way, and it uh, really crimps social life. When Britons reflected back on the war, more of them complained of the blackout than complained of rationing. It was quite frightening not to know where you were, where you were going. You'd, you, you'd lose a sense of sort of stability, um, but also a sense of fear, because you didn't know what was happening around you. There could be crime happening around you. If you're a woman walking on your own, there could be uh, a man coming up behind you you just didn't know, you were scared of noises. But all sorts of insecurities that came into play that when there were street lights around you, you just didn't even consider. In an effort to crack down on lawlessness and disorder, the government introduces a set of defence regulations that make many normal activities crimes. Hundreds of previously law-abiding citizens are caught up in a legal system where the lines between criminal and good citizen have been blurred. I spoke to a woman whose mother became a criminal when she went into a butcher's and bought an unweighed chicken. You weren't allowed to, to drive a light-coloured car, presumably because that could be seen from above. You weren't allowed to have car radio because that could be a transmitter used by spies. So all sorts of areas of society were suddenly, literally overnight, affected by laws that people didn't know had been brought in. So people were suddenly caught out. People became criminals just like that. As everyday behaviour suddenly becomes illegal, public respect for the law begins to break down. Together with a scarcity of consumer goods, this change in attitude gives rise to a huge nationwide criminal enterprise in which almost everyone participates, the black market. The black market was a sudden trade in objects which in peacetime were easily obtainable, but with the war suddenly become very, very scarce. Soap, babies' bottles, alarm clocks, decent whiskey. Alongside that, of course, were the food shortages because of the result of rationing. People would be quite prepared to do deals to get a few extra eggs for the family. There are stories that they were quite prepared to offer sexual favors to the butchers to get a, a, an extra cut of meat. The black market was seen as part of the victimless crime situation. The government has caused the problem, the government has clamped down. There is a kind of venomous feeling. It meant that people accepted theft. It meant that they were quite willing to cheat and steal and connive by using the black market in a way that they wouldn't have thought of doing. I'm talking about honest members of society. I'm talking about vicars. I'm talking about teachers. I'm talking about the police themselves. Participation in the black market forces millions of people to abandon their pre-war standards of morality. It also makes low-level street criminals, known as spivs, a useful point of contact for ordinary families looking to circumvent the new laws. There's a wartime stereotype of a cockney spiv. This person basically tended to look quite slick, he's quite well-dressed, perhaps a, a slick moustache, and he 
you've got a patter in the way he speaks. Yes, madam, we'd like a bit of this, we'd like a bit of that. The Spiv is the man who can get you more. And he's your friend because he can help you out. They sold goods on street corners, keeping a weather eye out for the local patrolling policeman, the Bobby. And if you knew the right person, you could obtain almost anything on that black market. It made some people an absolute fortune. People who didn't think of themselves at all as criminals would quite happily dabble, that was always the word, dabble in the black market. Have a bit here, have a bit extra there, there's no harm in it. The trouble was, there was no harm in it at their end, but once you get up to the other end, where there are armed robberies going on, they certainly wouldn't want to be associated with that violent end. For Billy Hill, the black market becomes the perfect foundation on which to build an empire. At first, like a lot of professional criminals, Billy Hill wasn't impressed by the black market. He regarded it as being small fry, too small scale, not worth his trouble. Then, of course, he realized very quickly that it was actually extremely lucrative. As the public demand for everyday items increases, Hill plans a spree of bold robberies to secure goods with which to feed and expand the market. Billy Hill said, the black art was Hitler's gift to the criminal world. The effect of the black market was to provide a whole new form of crime. Fur coats and jewellery, which were the kind of things he'd thieved before the war, were one thing. Now people needed cigarettes and whiskey and meat. It was a great warm welcome embrace that he walked into. He said, I didn't just exploit the black market, I fed it. Typically, Billy Hill always thought big. He'd fill entire warehouses with things like sheets. Hill organised the forgery of petrol coupons. He organised a house in Hertfordshire to which stolen goods could be taken. Forged documents for servicemen, for deserters who were on the run. He was able to harness all that and make it work. He has the system, he has the structure, he has a gang of heavies who can implement the crimes. They work for him. He was becoming boss of the underworld and he has got that team. Billy Hill's status was improving, uh, as it were, year by year in the underworld. He was becoming a major figure in London uh, there would be contacts uh, with the rest of the country. By late 1940, Hill has a burgeoning empire of stolen goods, contraband and forged documents. The money flowing in makes him one of Britain's most influential criminals. But Hill has even more ambitious plans. A series of high-stakes raids on an unlikely target, the post office. During this period, post offices were being used almost like banks by many citizens, but of course they didn't have guards in the same way that banks had. Billy Hill noticed this, and he saw this as a potential criminal target. In a bid to become Britain's most powerful gangster, Billy Hill is poised to launch a crime wave across London. A crime wave that no one sees coming or will be able to prevent. Prior to the Second World War, London's underworld worked largely in the shadows of society. And as long as it remained out of public view, the authorities would look the other way. Policing in the 1930s was more concerned about protecting the public from violence than it was bothering about the gangs of petty criminals as long as they didn't hurt the general public. The police themselves were incredibly lowly paid, so much so that most of them would be bought a pint of beer, which is another way of saying a bribe, uh, and there was nothing wrong with it. But by 1940, as Nazi bombs rained down on the city, London gangster Billy Hill is remodeling and expanding the underworld. Having taken control of the lucrative wartime black market, he launches a new, audacious type of crime, post office robbery. He began by raiding some of the warehouses and buildings belonging to the post office, which contained large amounts of cash. He then started hitting the vans that were taking amounts of cash from one post office to another. And this revolutionized the whole crime scene in London at that time. 
Billy regarded being a criminal as just like any other job. He himself said that the better you got at it, the harder you had to work at it. This new type of crime catches the security services completely off guard. Lacking numbers and struggling to respond to the nightly emergencies caused by Nazi bombing, the police are helpless as Hill takes advantage of the war and oversees an avalanche of postal robberies, heists and smash and grabs across London. In the war, you could enlist the public's support. For example, there were people called ARP wardens who helped clear bomb damage and so on. Hill's men would have ARP helmets on and direct the public, stand back, we're, we're clearing this, no need for you to come here, sir, stand away, while they just looted the premises. Mr. Big Time liked to do the big robberies, and he was committing and continued to commit these sort of crimes throughout the Second World War. At one stage, he even carried out a gold bullion robbery in Hatton Garden, claiming that he needed to get enough money together to support his family after he was going to be conscripted, but he actually never got conscripted. And the suspicion is that he paid someone off to avoid being conscripted. He was cautious. He planned things meticulously, and he had a kind of rapport, not just with the public, but with the police too. He was always very careful to be deferential to them. In the case of Chief Superintendent Edward Greeno, he always called you Mr. Greeno or Sir, and it was a kind of understanding, which is rare, but it seemed to have worked in Billy Hill's favor. Billy Hill stood out as a criminal because he was so cool, so calm, so well organized, and he was a good leader of men. He looked after his teams. People would share and share alike. There'd always been a, a policy of looking after wives and children while their husbands were away, and Hill carried that out. He was a good leader. I mean, he, he was liked by his people. He paid his debts. He behaved in criminal terms, he behaved very well. He, he was trustworthy. He ran his operation almost as if it was a corporation. He had a payroll and employees. He broke up fights. When members of his gang came out of jail, he would ensure there were clothes waiting for them and cash. By now, Hill is personally making around 400 pounds per week equivalent to £20,000 today from the black market. On top of that, high-value jewel heists and postal robberies can net the gang roughly five or £600,000 in a single job. Hill begins to bait his underworld rivals, walking into their Soho clubs without permission, dressed in expensive, tailored suits. Despite having a young wife at home, he is often seen in the company of mistresses, his trusty chiv hidden in his breast pocket, and frequently used to maim anyone who objects to his presence. He was running more operations than anyone else, and his skill was at running these crimes simultaneously and getting away with all of them. Unlike the black market, organized crime on this scale is not perceived to be victimless. Hill starts to attract the attention of the press, public and politicians, as his notoriety grows. People were outraged by the type of crimes that Billy Hill was committing during the war because most men were away fighting for king and country. And here was this professional criminal flouting the law, smashing, grabbing, robbing, thieving, racketeering. And there was a feeling that it was outrageous that he would do such a thing when most people were away fighting and risking their life and limb. Increasing pressure is brought to bear on the gang, and in 1940, an unsuccessful robbery in London's jewellery district lands Billy Hill behind bars. By the time he is released towards the end of 1941, the worst of the German bombing campaign is over. The Soviet Union has entered the war, and Hitler has turned his military machine away from English skies and towards the vast expanses of the East. The change in the pattern of the conflict means nothing to Billy Hill. Britain remains at war, and he leaves prison ready to rebuild his criminal empire. 
He gets out in 1941, goes straight back into the underworld and starts to commit the sort of crimes he was renowned for, but on an even bigger scale. The war was the making of Billy Hill. It enabled him to expand a range of contacts. It moved him into other fields of crime. There was a big criminal underworld in Manchester and indeed Liverpool, Leeds, where there was money, there was crime. He was now probably the most influential criminal in the West End. And the West End has become a more violent, dangerous and edgy place than it had been in the days before the war. All types of chances, opportunists and deserters flood into wartime Soho, swelling the ranks of the underworld and bringing the law of the gun with them. There's an increased availability of guns simply because the number of servicemen and service personnel coming into London as a result of the war you had American and Canadian servicemen bringing guns in, but you've got other nationalities as well. There were over 20,000 deserters in London during the war. Those guys would have had weapons too. Deserters were people who had very little to lose. I mean, there were already, the authorities were looking for them, and they couldn't get ordinary jobs, so they had to live on their wits. And that meant they were willing to take all kinds of criminal chances. And there were quite a surprising number of them. All these people entered the underworld. They, they increased it in size. They had so little to lose. They made it significantly more violent than it had been before. Reputation was all important to Billy Hill. Criminals wanted to join his gang. They could see how much money they were all making. And they could see the success ratio that Billy Hill was managing to attain. Yeah, OK, he did go to prison a few times, but overall he was getting away with probably 95% of the crimes that he and his gang committed. But in August 1942, his luck runs out again. During a postal robbery in London, Hill's getaway vehicle is rammed by a nearby lorry, and he is returned to prison, this time with a four-year sentence. Although his rapid rise has come to an abrupt halt, it won't be the last that the world will hear from Billy Hill. 1947, two years after the Allied victory over Nazi Germany. Having exploited the chaos of war to build a criminal empire, London gangster Billy Hill has spent the last few years languishing in prison. When he is returned to the streets, he finds the new modern underworld to be very different from the one he left. The villains became even more daring. They looked at bigger targets, places like Heathrow Airport. They would hit bigger post office vans, they'd hit bigger banks. After the war, the underworld became far more structured. The guys who'd been away in the military were coming back fit and trained to behave in a certain way. Project crime was going to become the name of the game because they were used to planning and organizing kind of masterminds who could then carry off something like the Great Train Robbery in the 1960s, because they were used to working in teams and units. The changes suit Billy Hill and his ambitions. His greatest asset remains his criminal mind, and he sees an opportunity to harness the strength of the post-war underworld and professionalise it. Previously, with the families like the Sabinis, this was disorganised crime, whereas with Billy, what you're getting was the start of real organised crime. He moved on to a different level. He stepped back from being so overly involved in a lot of the crimes and robberies himself and became the managing director of crime, the guy who would supply the finance for the arranging of a crime, particularly robberies. Billy Hill emerged from the end of the war as the King of Soho, the King of London, the godfather of the underworld. And Soho becomes the center of post-war glamour. Servicemen returning from the war flood into its bars, clubs and spielers looking for a good time. And London's gangsters, most prominently Billy Hill, suddenly become fashionable. Remember that London at that period was very drab for most people. They were wearing old clothes, uniforms. But if you went to Soho, you would see the spivs with wider than regulation lapels, beautiful suits, chunky rings, 
big hats with the brim turned up, moustaches, pipes or cigars, looking affluent. So you knew straight away that you were in an almost cinematically different place from the rest of London. Hill was a celebrity criminal. He referred to himself as the Humphrey Bogart of British crime. He didn't look unlike Bogart, and he had himself photographed in very expensive Savile Row suits. His wife wore very expensive furs, all of it stolen. By now, Hill is concentrating exclusively on high-stakes raids with huge rewards. In 1952, he carries out the East Castle Street robbery. With a value of over £7 million today, it is the biggest criminal heist Britain has ever seen. The East Castle Street robbery, which was just off Oxford Street, was a, an attack on a post office van, brilliantly organised, one has to say that. He rehearsed his men in the suburbs under the pretext of making a film. One realised then what a major player he was because, apart from anything else, no one was arrested. It was done very carefully, almost like an army exercise. Everything was timed, and it became the precursor to other even bigger crimes, such as the Great Train Robbery, the Brinks Mat Robbery, and other such pivotal robberies committed in Britain. The press are quick to describe large-scale robberies and heists overseen by Billy Hill and his new professional underworld as a crime wave and questions are raised in Parliament as to how to stop the tide of lawlessness. These concerns, however, are largely ignored by the British public, whose experience of war has changed their perception of crime forever. People realised, after living through the experience of the Blitz, they couldn't suddenly expect the government to look after them, or the church, or their local MP. So everybody became a wee bit more lawless. People realised what they were capable of for the first time, they would do anything to survive. Hill spends long stretches of the 1950s pursuing criminal opportunities overseas. He will eventually return to Britain to launch a ferocious turf war against his former partner, the East London gangster Jack Spot. By the 1960s, many of the prominent gangsters are household names. Their activities followed eagerly by press and public alike. They owe it all to Billy Hill. What we had during the war were kids who had no fathers, there were no policemen about, the bomb sites were their playgrounds, and the whole criminal ethos was feeding off this. Some of the characters that Billy Hill mentored included the Cray twins, notorious London criminals, who went on to run the underworld 15 to 20 years later. But what of the Blitz? the Nazis' campaign of terror bombing that had allowed Hill to build his empire. Hitler had sent the Luftwaffe to break Britain, but for all the death and destruction, he failed, and against all the predictions of the military theorists, British resolve stood firm. The Blitzbeard is a reaction that the Germans don't take into account. They assume that if you spread terror from the air, you will destroy the will of an enemy population. The opposite occurs, and not just in Britain. Imagine Pearl Harbor. Imagine 9-11, and you put the Blitz in that context, the actual attack on British soil creates this galvanizing, crystallizing effect where British society pulls together to reject this invader and reject this invader's terroristic methods. People weren't going to see the bombs and just collapse into some sort of anarchy and chaos. People did indeed pull together. People did withstand the bombing. People were tough. Despite the surge in crime, Britain's response to the Blitz is still remembered as one of the nation's proudest moments. An American observer perhaps best summed up the mood when he said, by every test and measure I am able to apply, these people are staunch to the bone and won't quit. The British are stronger and in a better position than they were at the beginning.